Well, welcome everyone to Connect Science. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure and honor to introduce Steve Elledge. I think uh, everyone on the, on the webinar will know who Steve is. He's a Howard Hughes investigator, winner of the Alaska Prize, um, an esteemed chair professor here at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and what's really remarkable about Steve is that every year there are just new amazing stories coming out of the Elledge Laboratory. Uh, personally, I'm indebted to him both for professional advice and for helping to uh, mentor one of my students. Um, and I don't want to take any more time away from his lecture. So I'll just hand it over to you, Steve, please. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Um, let's see. Trying to get this to forward. Here we go. So the title of my talk is going to be One Step Backwards and Two Steps Forward, Approaches to Improved Immunotherapies. And I hope by the end, you'll see why I, I use that title. Um, and my talk's going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to give a general introduction to cancer evolution and genetics of that. And then I'm going to talk about tissue specificity in cancer and then the genetics of immune evasion. So this is background for most of you. You're all familiar with uh, 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 cancer evolution. As cancer cells grow, they get mutations that allow them to continue to proliferate in their environment and spontaneously gather more mutations. And they become a heterogeneous uh, set of clones um, that, uh, uh, that continue to grow. So the early evolutionary events include avoiding differentiation increasing proliferation rates, decreasing apoptosis, and then adapting to sort of intrinsic stresses like uh, hypoxia and the lack of nutrients and things like that. And so we call these changes growth and survival adaptations or GSA. And, and this area has sort of dominated the world of cancer research for the last 40 or 50 years. Now, in addition to uh, these GSA events, uh, once the clones get large enough, um, they encounter the immune system because they've gathered neoantigens and uh, sometimes self-antigens that the immune system reacts to. The immune system then clears away a lot of things. And you have a new tumor consisting of, of cells that are um, more resistant to the immune system. And I'll get back to this in a moment. And so at this point, evading the immune system becomes one of, one of the primary rate limiting steps in, in tumor growth. And that, that is one of the main selective pressures. And so we call this phase uh, immune system adaptation or IGA. So early events are more GSA oriented. They continue throughout the growth of the tumor, but you also have this ISA component of the immune system um, adaptation. So. Um, now, the, the second part of this has to do with tissue specificity um, and proliferation. And this is from a paper that we published back in 2018, but has relevance for what I'm going to tell you about today. And this is work from grad student Laura Sack, and joined later on in the project by postdoc Teresa Devoli, who's now at NYU. And, and the, um, the idea here was to do a gain of function experiment where we took ORFs. Uh, and overproduce them in, in cells in a library. So we had a library of ORFs, uh, about 30,000 ORFs, a lot of overlap because they were two different libraries. And we barcoded them so we could follow them and put them under a TET inducible promoter. Here you can see that when you add doxycycline, if you have GFP in there as the load, you can see it turns on. So these are very tightly regulated. And we did in just very simple in vitro proliferation screens. We infected, um, uh, these are now primary immortalized cells. Uh, they're not cancer cells um, because we wanted to see how normal cells behave to early oncogenic um, stresses. Um, so HMEX from breast, hp &Es from the pancreas, and IMR90 fibroblast. We let them grow for 10 days and we sequenced the barcodes before and after. And what we found was, was quite interesting and not expected. Um, we called them go genes if they made them proliferate and stop genes if they're anti-proliferative. And what you can see is that there are quite a bit of overlap between the two epithelial lines 
uh, the, the breast and pancreatic cells, over 50%. But the surprising thing was how little oh, uh, the gain of function GO genes overlapped. It was really only about 10%. And, and that was really pretty shocking to us. Um, we also did some IMR90s with half the library, and you can see the same was true there. Very few things overlapped for proliferation. In fact, only three genes in this uh, set of library uh, um, screens overlapped. Um, you also saw less overlap, but still significant overlap with the stop genes. So there are vast differences in the proliferation responses of these different cell types, and that really caught us off guard. Uh, in fact, the opposite is even true. That is that the GO genes for one uh, actually um, overlap the stop genes for another. So uh, this is the, uh, the GO gene overlap. This is the GO versus stop gene overlap for um, HPNEs. And, um, and, and also uh, the opposite um, GO and stop. So, so there are as many overlaps going in the opposite direction as there are going into the, the, in the same direction. And this says that the cells are wired very differently. Now, uh, this led us to, to uh, this general idea that cell states are in, in distinct tissues interpret oncogenic signals in a different way. Uh, we also analyzed the oncogenes and tumor suppressors in the libraries and showed that they actually only worked properly in the tissue that they were derived from as, as tumor suppressors and oncogenes. So the same input and in different cell types give you different outputs. And I just want to just point out for a minute the difference between a loss of function screen and a gain of function screen. The loss of function screen says, well, what's controlling the circuitry on and off as it is? But the gain of function screen is a little different. You're taking every ORF and turning it on and saying, if I push the system, how does the network react to that? So you're getting actually a phenotype that's quite different from the loss of function phenotype. You're saying not what is, but what is possible. And so it gives you a very distinct fingerprint. Now, is this surprising to us? Well, the magnitude was surprising, but the fact that there's tissue specificity shouldn't be terribly surprising because we know this from looking at cancer genes. So if you look at uh, the types of uh, drivers of melanoma versus breast cancer versus lung cancer, sometimes they have some in common, but many of them are different, including the chromosome arms that are gained or lost in those. So we've known that this exists, um, but the magnitude of it, I think, was really what was so surprising. And uh, we found this great review by Schneider et al. in Nature, Nature uh, Reviews of Cancer that looked at tissue specificity, and I highly recommend it as, as a review. Um, and this is the top 10 mutated genes in 12 different um, cancers. And so 120 possible genes. And if they're colored here, that means they're shared in, with another of the 12 here. So EGFR is shared with prostate cancer, uh, P53 is everywhere, um, PIK3A is in a lot of different cancers. But um, if you just do the overall analysis of these 120 possible genes, there are 56 total tumor suppressors that have been identified that make up these 120. Of those, 70% are unique to one tumor. Look at kidney here. So all of these are unique to kidney uh, of the 12 here. So 70% are used in only one other tissue, nine others are used in two different tissues, but the rest of them are made up by eight drivers. And these eight drivers make up 48% of these 120 genes. So you can see there's really vast amounts of tissue specificity and some rare overlaps, but still tissue specific. So tissue specificity is the rule not the, ex the exception, at least with response to cancer and proliferation. Um, so we were wondering if this really um, extended beyond proliferation control, in particular, what about the immune system? So getting back to the evolution of the immune response, as cancer cells you know, um, gain the ability to proliferate and outcompete their neighbors, as shown here, um, cells mutate as these little, um, uh, red dots or neoantigens, and of course they can present those on MHC. These cells are often die and are taken up by antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells or macrophages, 
And that can be used to educate a T cell response and expand T cells that can recognize these, these uh, tumor cells. They come back and start killing off the tumor. We've probably all had this happen where the, the tumor has been completely eliminated and you never know about it, right? But a fraction of these actually enter into an equilibrium where they start resisting the immune system. And they exist in this equilibrium phase for a while until there's a selection for cells that now can escape the immune system. And then they can begin to grow and, um, and disseminate and potentially metastasize. But at this, this is the point at which we can detect these because it's large enough to detect. So the escape from surveillance um, is, is a key part. Now we are all familiar with the, the amazing breakthroughs for immune checkpoint therapies that so many people have made important contributions to. And this has been great, especially for certain tumor types like melanoma, um, where a large fraction of people respond to these. But for other tumor types, there's not so much of a response. For example, breast cancer, and they even, um, uh, recently rescinded uh, the um, uh, FDA approval for a, uh, a checkpoint therapy for breast cancer because it really didn't work that well. So why do we think that is? Well, we think that part of it may be due to differences in immune evasion mechanisms, or tissue specificity perhaps. And so when you look at um, the spectrum of, of ways that melanoma escapes the immune system, um, a lot of them are responsive to PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4. Uh, now, this is also an issue of the number of mutations, but it's certainly not strictly that. And, um, and so many of them respond by survival, but breast cancers don't. And we think that they may be using other mechanisms in addition to this PD PD-1, PD-L1 axis. So the general idea is that we have a mismatch between our current tools and the cancer evasion mechanisms <coughs> that um, you know, existing immunotherapies work for some, um, but perhaps for breast cancer, as an example, they have uh, different mechanisms we need to understand uh, to get better tools. So basically, we need to learn more about immune evasion mechanisms. We can activate the T cell side, but what about the tumor side that's resisting the T cells? Even if the T cells are active, if they're resisting them in certain ways, it won't matter. So, so we turn to doing genetic screens. Um, you know, I like genetic screens because you don't have to know the answer. You just have to know the question and try to get the cells to tell you the answer. And we know, of course, CRISPR screens and shRNA screens before them have tremendous power especially in, in, um, in 2B culture, uh, to look for things that give you sensitivity or resistance to drugs, synthetic lethals, et cetera. But of course they don't take into account the complexity of the microenvironment of a tumor. So um, since avoiding immune destruction is a key um, uh, aspect of, of cancer evolution, one of the hallmarks, we wanted to identify genes whose lock it lost and packs the ability of the immune system to kill tumors. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself um, because this, this whole project started as a collaboration with Kevin Higus. Um, here's a picture of him when he was a young, happy uh, PI before he became uh, uh, someone who ran a big part of Dana Farber. I think he's still happy, uh, but this is a great picture of him I found for him. And, um, and, and, and two postdocs, one from my lab, Tim Martin, and Daniel Cook from, from Kevin's lab. And we'd been doing synthetic lethal screens with, with RAS, Tim had been. We wanted to know if they worked in, in vivo. So we decided to uh, uh, experiment in a colon cancer cell line from mice um, with a CRISPR library, the druggable library. And so we were going to look in vitro and in vivo and say, okay, which ones of our genes that work in 2D culture also work in a context of a tumor. And Kevin said, well, if you're gonna do that, why don't we also put it into a wild type mouse and, um, and see if we can find any uh, guides for CRISPR that make cells respond better to the immune system. And so Tim said, okay, I'll do that too. And so um, Tim and Danielle set up the screen. We took the druggable uh, CRISPR library um, 
of um, about 7,500 genes and affected it into the CT26 colon tumor lines. And later on, we did a breast cancer line, but I'm going to put them all together just to make it simpler. And we put it into three backgrounds. We grew them in vitro. Uh, and these are syngenic um, screens. And so the, these, these tumors lines evolved in the same background. So uh, we did it in, in vitro and a skid mouse and in a wild type immunocompetent mouse um, and injected the cells sub-Q and then pulled out the tumors after they grew. And you can see that there's a big difference in the rate in which they grow. So in skid mice, the tumors come up very fast, but it takes about a week longer in wild type mice. Now, even though these, these tumor lines had partially adapted to the immune system because they grew up as tumors um, in, in mice, uh, they still didn't grow very fast at all. And we think part of that is the fact that we put in two super antigens, uh, Cas9 and pure myosin resistance gene. So we, we front loaded them with really big uh, doses of, of new antigens for the immune system. And that was both good and bad, okay? And the bad part was that when we looked to see which genes might have dropped out more efficiently in the presence of the a wild type immune system, we found that so many things were completely eliminated that it was a big bottleneck and we couldn't really figure out which ones were dropping out better. Uh, in there, they're probably worse some. Um, but we also found that a lot more uh, in the wild type uh, animals grew better in the wild type tumor than it did in skid. And we actually started ranking these based on the differential between the skid and the wild type to look for things that really um, were much better. And, um, and so uh, we did both this uh, colon cancer line and this breast cancer line. And what we found again here was that there was some overlap, but there were a lot of differences and uh, a profound number of differences which reminded us of the tissue specificity. Now, these are also different cancers. They have different fibers, so that might be played a role in it, but we've now done this for, for five different cancers and they're all like this. So we think that there's very likely to be tissue specificity even when, let's say they both have breasts. Now, if you look at the, the intersection here, these 27, what you find is that that, en that enriches for antigen presentation genes and uh, interferon and things like that. So that makes sense. And, um, but there are also some other interesting genes in there. And one of them I'll, I'll talk about at the end of the talk, which is a, a G protein called GNA13. So, um, so, you know, we found the RAS synthetic lethals which I'm not gonna talk about, but, um, you know, we, and we didn't find, we kind of lost out on looking for a, a gene, if you knocked it out, would make it better for the immune system to kill off that cell, even though they probably exist in others. Many other people have done that. Um, but we were left with the genes that enriched. And Tim brought me the list and it was just a, it seemed like a random list of genes. But I noticed that since we'd also spent a fair bit of time a few years ago, uh, working out algorithms to predict tumor suppressors, I was very familiar with that list. And in comparing, looking at the list of genes that enriched, I noticed that there were a lot of tumor suppressors in it. And, uh, and we went back and looked at that specifically. And there was a tremendous enrichment for tumor suppressor genes that specifically enriched in, um, in the wild type versus skid. And so this is a ranking. Um, and um, when you, when, uh, and here, uh, um, what we're looking at here is the um, in yellow are, the, are genes who by virtue of their mutational pattern in the TCGA uh, uh, tumor sequencing project, uh, we rank as a tumor suppressor based on loss of function uh, and missense mutation rates. And um, so in the entire library, there are only uh, 219 tumor suppressors, um, about 3%. But in this list, they were 33%. And so there was a tremendous enrichment. And you can see it in the next slide, which is volcano plot, where we now, um, uh, this is in the breast cancer model. We now in color, uh, just show you uh, which genes were tumor suppressor genes in humans. And you can see over here, there's a tremendous enrichment uh, for these genes um, in the upper right quadrant. So 
Um, this suggests that a major role for tumor suppressors is to evade the immune system. And many of these are um, genes that are in the, uh, the sort of long tail. They're not genes that have been studied a lot, but things that, that occur uh, more rarely in tumors, uh, perhaps they're tissue specific, or perhaps there are many that can do the same job. And that's why any one of them shows up at a lower frequency. Um, but if you look at both the breast cancer model and the colon cancer model, you can see that relative to um, um, in vitro and skid mice, uh, tumor suppressors are showing up at a, at a very high pace here, um, you know, nine to, to 12 times more frequently than you would predict on average. And they're also uh, enriched, uh, these, these genes which are found in a colon and, and breast model are enriched in other tumor types too that are mostly epithelial um, um, or in the pan cancer. Uh, uh, tumor suppressor gene list. So um, just getting into a little bit more um, detail about um, what we're finding. So in the colon cancer here, we looked at the top 40 predicted tumor suppressor genes that were in our library that were mutated in human colon to some degree. And we compare it to how these uh, guides worked in vitro or in skid tumors um, or in the wild type immune system. And you can see some of these are, are growing in, um, in, um, in both or all three of these. There's P53, but there's some other genes here um, that tend to just be pro-proliferative, uh, but there are clearly some that only work uh, well uh, in, in the wild type immune system setting. So this is of the, the 40 that are, um, uh, the most enriched. But if you just ask what's the most enriched, there are many, many genes um, that have a much stronger effect uh, in wild type than skid tumors, many of which, by the way, are not mutated in this, in this tumor type. So this is kind of weird. Why all of a sudden are they escaping the immune system in this tumor type when they don't spontaneously arise in this tumor type? And and that question um, brings up the point that, that sporadic tumor suppressors are, by definition, um, haploid insufficient. The first hit has to have a phenotype in order for you to expand that clone in a meaningful way. And if they're not haploid insufficient in that tissue type, there could still be a tumor suppressor, but only if you get rid of two copies. With CRISPR, you always get rid of two copies or you have that ability uh, easily. So we think that that's really what's going on here. Uh, the things on the left are all haploid and sufficient, but that's no limitation here on the right. Same thing was true um, in the breast cancer line, the same um, um, curious findings uh, here. Many of these are enriched in the wild type, but not in the skid or in vitro at all. Um, um, and, and some are, are mildly enriched in SCID. Um, and we think that those are probably like P53 are, are increasing the growth rate, but you probably go through more rounds of growth in, in, um, because it takes longer to expand the cells in the wild type. But we think that that is not enough to explain the differences uh, because even strong things like P53 um, and, and these things, they, they do show up. But there are many others that, um, that you can see are growing pretty well in the skid uh, and don't show up over here. So, and P10 is quite an interesting example in, in the breast line here, because you can see it shows up even better in the skid than it does in the presence of the immune system. So now I wanna just focus on one gene that we, that we decided to study in greater detail, because it showed up in a lot of uh, different screens that we did. And so this is a, a G protein called GNA13, and it's um, <clears throat> part of a heterotrimeric uh, G protein. And this is just how uh, these the four different guides behaved in, um, in both breast and colon uh, screens. And this is the log two fold chain. So it's really quite large um, uh, impact here. And so these heterotrimeric G proteins um, exist um, in cells as a 
trimer. They're not shown touching each other here, but they're hooked up to a, um, a GPCR, which is a G protein coupled receptor. There's usually a ligand that um, is used to activate them. And when they're activated, then this switches into the GTP state and these dissociate from each other. Now, what was known about GNA13 before we started this was that there was some evidence that can affect uh, rho GEFs and rho A activation, um, which have, activates transcription and some morphology. There are also inhibitors of AKT, which didn't explain anything for us. Um, but there must be more going on here that we were interested in, at least in these cell types. So we went looking in much greater detail about this. So the first question we asked was whether it affected um, proliferation. So here we have four guides and how well they knock down GNA13. And um, relative to control guides over here on the left, there's really no growth advantage. This one is uh, a little slower even, but they, they show no growth advantage in vitro. Um, the, other, the other types of experiments we did was we, we looked at whether it affected HLA expression, so antigen presentation, or uh, a CD8 T cell killing. In vitro, we set that up. There's no effect of loss of, of GNA13 at all. So it must be something different. And so to get at this, um, um, we decided to just validate these, the guide RNAs um, in vivo. Uh, so we took four uh, different guide RNAs plus 4,000 controls and put them into these. Um, um, these, these CT26 colon cancer lines into a biopsy mouse and uh, redid this whole screen and just looked by sequencing what happened. So what you can see is that in vitro, they did nothing. In the skid, if anything, they sort of dropped out. Um, but in the wild type, they, uh, they grew um, strongly enriched with, for all four of these guides. So to get at the, the mechanism of how this might work, we, um, uh, we decided to do RNA-seq analysis on these cells. So um, we did it both in vitro, comparing guides and, and uh, controls, um, or we did it uh, in, in wild-type mice and um, looked at the tumors. And what we found was, um, of course, some things go up and some things go down. It always happens. Um, but our eye was caught by this one gene, CCL2 because that had been previously implicated in the immune system. So what does it do? Well, it's a chemokine that recruits immune cells to the tumor. And so uh, there are a number of these chemokines shown over here on the left, and these represent different types of immune cells, macrophages, uh, dendritic cells, monocytes, et cetera. And CCL2 is known to recruit these in particular, they're known to recruit macrophages and what are call, called tumor associated macrophages. And of course, they have been um, implicated in many aspects of tumor genesis, promoting tumor genesis, including promoting tumor growth and metastasis and also migration invasion. Uh, and they're um, you know, producing different factors to modify the tumor microenvironment to, to change their behavior. But in addition to those, uh, and, and you can see it's, these have been involved in all kinds of aspects or implicated in all kinds of aspects of tumor genesis. They've also been um, implicated in modifying the activity of T cells. For example, inducing Treg induction or starving T cells metabolically, um, or just directly inactivating T cells with prostaglandins. So this seemed like a promising area. So we started looking at the macrophages and how they respond um, to CCL2. Um, uh, but first we had to, to show that knocking out GNA13 actually increased CCL2, both at the RNA level and the protein level, just to confirm um, what we found by RNA-seq. And so um, this is the CCL2 transcription uh, transcripts. Um, uh, and uh, what you can see here in the control cells versus the two different guides, 
the guides are making a lot more uh, CCL2 transcript. Uh, this is even more than what we saw in RNA-seq in, in these experiments looking at uh, using a digital droplet PCR, which is much more accurate than just regular um, quantitative PCR. Um, and so then we said, okay, well, that's good. That part works. CCL2 is going up when you knock out um, GNA13. Uh, what about the protein level? And um, we use CCL2 ELISAs from the supernate of these cells. And what you can see is that CCL2 levels go up, um, not as much as the RNA, but quite a bit in the GNA13 knockouts compared to our two controls. So that says that the system works the way we thought it, it is inducing it, um, but what's the effect of CCL2? So the first experiment was just to, um, to ask if it was sufficient for growth by making uh, a CCL2 expression construct uh, on the EF1 alpha, under the EF1 alpha promoter, which is one of the stronger promoters. We put it on a lentivirus uh, versus control and put it into these cells. Um, and you can see that they, as they should, make a lot more CCL2 um, protein. Um, but then we ask the question, well, what happens when you put these cells into the, the, um, the mouse and look at tumor genesis? And what you can see is that CCL2 makes these tumors grow much faster in the wild type mouse. So um, that says it's sufficient, but is it necessary? So in order to do this experiment, we knocked out CC, uh, GNA13 cells, or sorry, we made knockout GN, GNA13 cells and um, then either put in a control guide or knocked out CCL2. And so this just shows you that these cells uh, lack CCL2 being secreted in the medium. And then we said, okay, well, what happens now in a tumor genesis assay? And uh, what you can see here is that um, a GNA13 relative to the um, control in blue grows uh, much faster. Um, but then if you then knock out CCL2, it goes back down to control levels. So that says that not only is CCL2 sufficient, it's necessary in the absence of a GNA13 uh, to um, promote tumor genesis in a wild type immune background. And so we then decided to look more carefully at the, um, the macrophages because that was the likely mechanism. And so uh, here you can see that um, just looking at the total number of, or the, the percent of live cells in the tumor, which you can do by fax analysis of um, cells, uh, what fraction of them are macrophages? So when you knock out GNA13 in red here, you can see that there's an increase of about um, um, two or three fold in total number of macrophages uh, in the tumors. And if you knock out CCL2, that goes back to background levels. So uh, that argues, of course, that, this, that CCL2 is recruiting macrophages. And there's a particular macrophage, there's, there's two types, M1 and M2. One is thought to be more anti-tumorogenic M1, one is more pro-tumorogenic M2 macrophages, and they have a particular cell surface marker, CD206. So we then asked, okay, um, of the total number of macrophages, is there an increase in the M2 levels? Um, and in fact, there is, and it's about, um, about a 30% increase um, over um, the, the background. And if you uh, knock out CCL2, uh, you're close to background levels. So that argues that uh, M2, the pro-tumorogenic uh, tumor-associated macrophages are, are being increased and probably uh, represent the, 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 a significant portion of this increase um, in the macrophages. So, so we have CCL2 is important. CCL2 brings in macrophages and, and macrophages of the type that are pro-tumorogenic, but is it really the macrophages or not that are important? So we set out to then uh, eliminate the macrophages from the tumor and ask what happens to the tumor. So the way this works is that we use this liposome that has um, cladroninate, and I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, but um, 
Um, this is a, a toxic chemical, uh, dichloromethylene diphosphonate. And diphosphonates, uh, you probably have heard of uh, in chemotherapies. So they're very toxic, but they're protected. They protect cells within these liposomes, which they can't really you know, enter the cell easily. Um, and so um, you can make these uh, and inject them. And uh, macrophages, um, as their name implies, eat things, and they are constantly sampling um, uh, the environment around them, looking for antigens and sometimes even pathogens. Um, and um, they take up a lot of these liposomes and they end up breaking down and killing the cells. So you can eliminate the macrophages by adding these liposomes. And this just shows you, if you're looking at macrophages, this is from the original paper, um, you, you can completely eliminate them. Um, so, um, so we did that experiment. And so um, if you, uh, I'm just gonna show you this in pieces here. Um, if you take um, control guides that don't knock out anything and you add liposomes that have just PBS in them as a control or cladronate, um, not a lot happens. There's some subtle differences, but not much going on here. But if you do this to GNA13 cells, here's GNA13 knockout. Um, of course, they grow better as we've shown before, but now when you add them, um, add to them, these, these liposomes that have the toxins, then they're back to background levels. They're um, just about the same as whether, whether you had or did not have GNA13. And that's quantified here. Um, GNA13 alone uh, has a much higher tumor mass. When you um, get rid of, uh, of uh, the macrophages, it goes back to uh, indistinguishable from background. So this argues for the following model. And um, normally um, CCL2 is off. And, um, uh, but if, if uh, so, so with GTP, uh, this is turned off. Uh, we don't know, we think we might know what the receptor is now. We're still doing those experiments. We have no understanding of what the ligand would be for this. And if there, even if there is a ligand that's present. Um, uh, but if you knock out this so that now you can't uh, carry out the signaling, then uh, CCL2 becomes derepressed. And we don't know what the pathway is either, but we should be able to find it. CCL2 becomes derepressed and uh, secretes, um, um, secretes into the microenvironment and changes the microenvironment. So that's shown here. If you have a wild type GNA13, um, you have a, a microenvironment that um, is, is accessible um, uh, to the immune system to some degree, but, um, but when you get rid of GNA13, you recruit these, um, these macrophages and they make you resistant to the immune system. So you have an advantage over other um, cells um, in, in wild type, in the presence of wild type immune system. So, um, so that's our model here. So um, let's just take one step back and uh, think about what we set out to do and what, what we um, actually accomplished, which was not what we set out to do. So, um, so we initially set out to look for uh, mut mutations in genes that would um, allow you to, to the immune system to have greater accessibility. And in principle, you should be able to get them. We probably did get some of them, um, but, um, but if they worked, if that cell escaped the immune system and you wanted to make it more sensitive to the immune system, let's say it changed the microenvironment, it would be difficult to actually find it because even though that cell is knocked out, all the other cells are still secreting those proteins that that tumor type had. So it's unlikely that you would necessarily see an enrichment of that. But if you can make a cell resistant to the immune system, uh, the immune system will carve out a niche around that and allow that cell to grow. Um, 
And so um, that's something we could do very easily in this type of screen. So we asked which genes, and we're forced to ask, we found out we were asking a question. You often start out asking one question, and until you do the experiment, you don't actually know what that question was. That's a genetic screen. Um, but the, um, we can ask now for any individual tumor in, in, um, in a syngenic model, which genes or mutations enhance tumor genesis. And what's nice about the system is that you end up with a potential isogenic situation where you have wild type for gene A or mutant for gene A. Um, and the mutants actually grow better in wild type tumors. And so then you can ask the question like we did, well, what's the difference between these two um, cell, cells genetically different that allows the immune evasion? And that um, is great because you can't just take two different tumors and start comparing them. There's so many changes. You can never figure out, you know, which change that you see is relevant. But when you just have one gene that's plus or minus, you have a shot at that. And so once you have that, then you can say, well, you know, if we can figure out what's going on here, can we figure out a reversal mechanism? And, um, and of course we have many different um, isogenic uh, potentials here. We have many different genes that we can begin to study. And, and, um, and then, you know, the idea is that they'll be using lots of different evasion mechanisms. And, um, and right now we have about 40 or 50 genes that we're starting to focus in on to learn more about the evasion strategies in the same way that we did GNA13. Now you might say, well, there's so many different genes, you know, how could they possibly figure it out? There's so many different mechanisms. Is every tumor gonna need, uh, you know, a very specific therapy? And that would be impossible. Um, and, and I think that the, the likely explanation is that, that actually there may be for any given tumor, a lot of genes that are involved, but it's very likely that they uh, work in a defined set of mechanisms that work in that cell type. So we think that that would be like the pathway that does CCL2 and the pathway that does something else and that they'll coalesce into a smaller subset of uh, actual evasion strategies. So that's the idea here that, you know, by accidentally having to take one step backwards, we wanted to just take one step forward and find the key gene that you could knock out so the immune system would be better. And the idea being that if, it, if you could figure out how the cells are resisting, then maybe that would be a complementary therapy to some of the immune checkpoint therapies that we're now studying. And if you can figure out what the cell's secreting or what's on its surface that's different, you can intercept that signaling, that communication with the microenvironment, and then make the microenvironment um, work better with the, with the immune system. So instead of going one step forward, we actually went one step backwards to make it worse, make the tumor worse. But that allows us to take this sort of strategy to figure out the mechanisms um, and then potentially um, take two steps forward, that is to get a therapy that might work. Um, so, um, so this just is the, the, the summary here. The immune evasion mechanisms appear to be tissue specific, uh, much like proliferation regulators. Um, and you know, this goes along with the, the, the uh, tissue specificity being the rule, not the exception. Uh, and in cancer. And, and while many genes are potentially involved, they will employ a finite number of strategies of evasion. And identifying those strategies will be facilitated by having these isogenic pairs of cell lines. And once the mechanisms are defined, then specific therapeutic interventions to circumvent the immune evasion may be devised and employed. And that this is a, uh, a way to to try to understand what's happening on the tumor side um, uh, that would be complementary to what we can now do on the T cell side. And hopefully, you know, through this sort of approach, we can take a, um, uh, make a, uh, uh, devise strategies that may end up helping um, 
and different tumor types. It's a, it's a long road, but I think we need to understand these evasion mechanisms to take advantage of the full potential of the immune system. So I just wanna stop here and thank the people who uh, did this work. So um, the initial work on tissue specificity was done by Laura Sack and Teresa Davoli. I didn't go through their whole paper, but there, it was a great, uh, great study on their part. And it was published in Nick and Cell in 2018. And then the current work here was spearheaded by Tim Martin um, in collaboration with, with Kevin Higgis' lab and Danielle Cook uh, on the initial screens. And then Tim and Rupesh, um, a grad student in my lab, pushed forward uh, many of the, the later experiments. Uh, AJ Patel uh, and uh, Daisy Choi and Tony Liang and Mamie Lee all participated and supported this work in one way or another. Um, and uh, of course, these are our funding sources. And I just want to specifically give a shout out to Specify Cancer um, and uh, from the Cancer Research UK Grand Challenges Program. That's our team that Kevin and I are on and the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research. So I can stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, the questions are really starting to come in. While they do, I, I have a couple, um, some prosaic and some uh, sort of theoretical. So the one is you, you, the, the models you're using for these cell lines, they're basically gaining an incremental fitness, right? The wild type kills. Um, so have you thought about screens instead where you have a, a model where the mouse is actually capable of clearing an injected tumor, say because you've pre-vaccinated it or, or something else, and now you're selecting for uh, cells that are truly capable of escaping with the gain of function compared to the rest of the population? Yeah, I, that's a great question. So I think that uh, you could do it that way. And that's something to think about. You'd have to, you know, immunize for each individual tumor. Um, but I think we're kind of accomplishing the same thing by giving them lots of neoantigens that we know they will then react to. And um, so I think we kind of got lucky and unlucky at the same time with that. Um, but, the, um, but it's clear that they, they, they wallop the cells that we put in there initially because there's such a delay in what's coming out, plus the fact that they're, now we lose a lot of, of things. So we bottleneck in the wild type and not in the skid. I think by giving it, it takes about a week for the immune system to really rev up. So the cells adapt, they're growing. So they're sort of in a, in a good place, you know, from the shock of being injected. And of course we could do a better job of injecting them into the tissues where they actually would grow as opposed to the sub Q. But right now we can't get quite enough cells in some of these locations, but, um, yeah, and so they're starting to grow and adapt and then the immune system comes in. We actually think that's probably an advantage as opposed to the immune system just waiting there and grabbing them. They may not even have time uh, to set up a, uh, the infrastructure of remodeling uh, the microenvironment to get away from it. So um, it may not work as well if you pre-vaccinate, um, but one never knows. Um, yeah, you just wonder whether you're missing components of the response that relate to memory. Um, well, you would definitely, you would definitely uh, select for things that just block antigen presentation, but we get those anyway, you know, and we're kind of avoiding that. And we can also get that in vitro too. Um, yeah, and then I wonder whether you looked at, I know there are differences in the um, SERP alpha, gene in, in nod mice versus, yeah, uh, and the extent to which some of that could be affecting some of these macrophage responses. Yeah, that's definitely possible. And, um, you know, we, we tried not to, we, we went with the SCID model and we've done the RAG model for others and we stayed away from the nods. Um, but you haven't you know, done- We, we know uh, that if you, if you yeah. knock out, some of the things actually really drop out of, of skid mice, but don't drop out of the rags as much, you know, and, and some of those we think are, are being uh, hit by uh, NK cells and things. So if you lose antigen presentation completely, you actually get hurt a lot in, in those, but that sort of balances out a little bit. Um, 
So we haven't done not mice. Um, yeah, and then in the in the B cell lymphoma is the work from Jason Sister and others has found that um, S one PR two and P two R Y eight seem to be really important interactors with GNA thirteen. I'm just curious if that's somewhere you've looked or that holds. Up. Um, yeah, I'd have to ask him where exactly he looked. I think uh, in terms of the receptors. Yeah. Um, yeah, that doesn't ring a bell, uh, but I um, I'd have to double check on that uh, if if that is involved. All right, so let's go through some of these questions. Uh, first is um, any human survival data related to uh, immune checkpoint therapy for levels of expression of CCL2 or GNA13? Uh, we have not looked at that. I think that's a really good, um, that's a, it's a good question and that's something that we should definitely do. I think we've been so busy um, following up on this, this has just got published a couple months ago, so we haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay. Um, any, is it surprising to you that um, there's no effect from knocking out CCL2 in the, in the control setting? Um, well, I didn't know what to think about that. Um, it looked like the level of expression went up like twofold or something, not from nothing to on. Yeah, I don't think you can really gauge what other mechanisms might be at play. You know, uh, GNA13 may affect transcription, but it could also impact other aspects of functionality. So um, I was a little surprised there wasn't a bigger effect of getting rid of the macrophages altogether. <laughs> um, the CCL2, I didn't know what to think about. Um, so, uh, so I wasn't surprised, but on the other hand, I didn't know what to expect. Okay. Um, and I'd also like to point out one other thing about the previous question, which is that CCL2 has actually been implicated in some context to actually um, um, inhibit tumor genesis. So there's context too. So that I think that the study of looking in different tumor types for expression and, and, uh, and whether or not they impact uh, uh, checkpoint therapy would be interesting if you have enough of different tumor types to look at, because it may go in opposite directions. Uh, so a question about so the haploid switching tumor suppressor genes uh, in specific tissues um, that don't show mutations, the extent to which there's transcriptional or epigenetic alterations in some of those. Uh, and then I would also ask about um, X-linked genes. It looked like you had quite a few, you know, KDM 6A and 5C and other things like that that do show up on the X. Um, yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't looked at the X. Uh, well, first of all, some of those actually have genes on the Y in the pseudo-autosomal region. So they're not actually uh, X-linked in the classicals. They are, but they're not, you know, they're actually complemented. So we actually did, uh, you know, in Devoli et al. 2013, where we looked at the tumor suppressor analysis. I encourage anyone to go back and look at that paper for the overall scheme of logic that we used. Uh, to figure out this, this half-low insufficiency idea. Um, but about 35% to 30 to 40% of all genes are half-low insufficient. Um, and just on average, and, and that you can see that in the mouse knockout data that people have looked uh, at knocking at the mouse genome knockout. Uh, so that held, but we predicted that based on the principles that we had identified for growth control. So, um, so that's important to, to think about just the, the overall structure of, of that, but there are a lot of haplo insufficient genes out there. Um, so I'm not sure I answered the question now, but. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I guess it's really about this distinction that you, you know, really nicely pointed out around what we see in patient tumors versus what's possible through a CRISPR screen? And are we creating artificial scenarios with a CRISPR screen? Could some of these mechanisms, as you start to fill out your tree of you know, the many different ways that the immune system could be avoided, would actually never happen or would be very, very rare because it would require two hits? Well, I think that they may be rare in one tissue and frequent in another. The question is, is the mechanism the same? The fact that they can do something suggests there's a mechanism to be had. And whether you'll ever find a particular gene mutated in you know, a particular tumor or not, that you could say, oh, well, now we have a biomarker, we know what to look for. 
um, you know, that may not happen, but that doesn't mean that the pathway that is there uh, to, to evade isn't being activated by some other component in the system that's, that is either under an oncogene control, which is dominant, or under a different tumor suppressor in that pathway that's haploid sufficient. So knowing, I think, the identity of the mechanisms has a lot of power independently of whether or not you can predict one gene doing it or another. So what's out there? That's the question. And that's what we hope to find. And then um, what do you think is the need for verifying these within autochthonous models? Um, well, I think eventually that's going to be important to do. And it's not simple to do it. No. Uh, but at this stage, there's so much to be figured out so quickly using these models that I don't think we will be going after that anytime soon. But I welcome other people to do it. In fact, I welcome other people to take the same approach because I think it's a decent approach. And, um, and a lot of the data, people have done a lot of these screens already and they probably haven't analyzed it the same way that we analyzed it. So there's data sitting in databases that they can look at and go, well, okay, maybe we can go after using this strategy and make it further because this is way bigger than any lab can possibly do. And so um, I'm hoping that, you know, that, that this will spur other people on to, to systematically look at the escape mechanisms and their favorite models. Uh, there's a question about CCL2 and its relationship to neutrophils. I think just more broadly, did you look at the tumors uh, for their immune composition uh, in presence or absence of GNA13 and CCL2 overexpression and so on? Yeah, we did. And we didn't see a big difference in neutrophils. Um, um, what I can't remember if we saw any difference at all, though, but it wasn't striking. Okay. Um, I think we're getting close to the hour. That was just a, an amazing talk. Thank you so much. I do want to invite everyone back uh, for Connect Science. Next week, um, we have another outstanding talk and uh, a series of subsequent talks from there. Check out the website. And um, if we have any subsequent questions, we'll make sure that Steve gets uh, access to those and can respond. Um, so thank you again for your time and everyone, please be well. Thanks for the invitation.